Hello and welcome to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing, where nursing comes to life. In this podcast, you give us 15 minutes of your day and we'll take one complicated nursing topic and make it easy. Ready for nursing to be fun? I'm Morgan, and today we're shifting gears over into right-sided heart failure. Last episode, we talked about what it looks like when the left side of the heart fails, and now we are shifting over to the right. Now, this doesn't get the spotlight as much as left-sided heart failure, but the consequences can be super dramatic. So let's jump in first to our practice question here. Remember, Tuck your answer away for the end. We will circle back to the right answer and why. The nurse is assessing a client recently admitted with the diagnosis of heart failure. The client reports decreased appetite and feeling bloated. The nurse notes pitting edema in the lower extremities and jugular venous distension. Lug sounds are clear bilaterally and the client denies shortness of breath. Which of the following findings most strongly support the diagnosis of a right-sided heart failure? A is bilateral crackles and orthopnea. B is frothy sputum and an oxygen saturation of 89%. C is JVD, that jugular venous distension and peripheral edema. And then D is an S3 heart sound with exertional dyspnea. As always, let's start with the basics. The right side of the heart receives deoxygenated blood from the body. Everything that's been used up and needs to go back to the lungs for a refill. It takes that blood, sends it into the pulmonary circulation, and the lungs handle the oxygenation. The left side then takes it from there and pumps it out to the body. Now imagine the right side of the heart is struggling. Maybe it's weak, stiff, overloaded, whatever. But that blood coming in from the body hits a wall. It cannot move forward to the lungs and it therefore backs up into the body. Think of it like a highway pile up. Nothing's getting through. Traffic builds up all the way back into the suburbs. In this case, that's going to be the body. So we see it in the neck veins, the liver, the abdomen, the legs. The signs of right-sided heart failure really show up in the body. So we get JVD jugular venous distension. Blood is pooling in those upper veins. Peripheral edema, legs and ankles are swollen. Hepatomegaly, ascites, lots of congestion in the liver and abdominal organs. And then generally, how are they going to feel? Heavy, full, bloated, swollen, because they got extra fluid in their body. It's trying to go forward to the right and get out to the lungs, but that right side is failing. It can't move it forward. A metaphor I like is if the left side of the heart is the forward facing like garden hose, it's pushing water out to the plants while you water your garden. The right side is like the intake hose. It's pulling water out from the barrel. And if that hose gets blocked, water backs up and spills out of the barrel, soaking everything around it. That is right sided heart failure, that systemic fluid overload. Now, here's something important. Right-sided heart failure, it almost always follows left-sided heart failure. What? How does that happen? Well, the left side can't pump the blood forward. Let's say we have a high afterload. Maybe there was an MI, so that left ventricle gets weak, and it just can't move that blood forward out of the lungs into the body. So pressure builds up. In the lungs, remember L for left-sided, L for lungs, we get lots of pulmonary congestion. Well, that pulmonary congestion increases the pressure in that pulmonary circuit. So that puts more pressure on the right side. The right side has to work harder and harder to get blood through to the lungs. And over time, it gets tired too. So left-sided heart failure can lead to right-sided heart failure. But honestly, anything increasing that pressure in the pulmonary side, maybe pulmonary hypertension, chronic lung disease like COPD, maybe you throw a PE, we've got a pulmonary embolism going on, high pressure in the lungs, the right ventricle has a hard time pushing that forward, blood backs up in the body. Now on to our case. For me, my most memorable client with right-sided heart failure was, like in many cases, someone who started with left-sided heart failure first. Over time, 
the pressure from the lungs backed up so much that it eventually pushed the right ventricle into failure as well. So this was a 68-year-old male. They had a long history of hypertension and previous MI, myocardial infarction. This is a classic setup for left-sided heart failure. Why? Well, that hypertension is a high afterload. So it's really pushing that left ventricle and making it harder and harder for it to pump blood forward. So of course, over time, that left ventricle starts to wear out. Well, then he goes and has a heart attack. So we have damage to the tissue, making that ventricle weaker. So we've got weak tissue, poor contractility, harder to pump forward, and a high afterload, that hypertension that we're pumping against. So that is a classic setup for the left-sided heart failure. Okay, so I first met this client. I was on a med surge rotation at a hospital out in California. It was their first hospital admission. He came in because he was getting worsening shortness of breath. He was like, I cannot even make it from the bedroom to the kitchen. I've got to stop to rest. I'm sleeping propped up on like four pillows, but I just can't even catch my breath anymore. That shortness of breath was what was really bothering him. He had known hypertension. He was on an allopril for that. It was only two years since he had had his myocardial infarction. He was still taking aspirin for that, but otherwise not on any other meds. I do my assessment and crackles in the bases of his lungs. O2 sat is like borderline. If I remember right, it was like 93 to 94. Obviously not horrible. Chest x-ray, pretty fine, like not full-blown pulmonary edema or anything, but the physical exam showed someone really swollen, horrible peripheral edema, ankles super puffy, like really hard to pull on socks. They were so puffy, lots of ascites in the belly. I asked him about that. I'm like, is this normal for you? He's like, I mean, I feel kind of bloated, but you know, now that you mention it, I actually haven't been able to wear any of my jeans. I've only been able to put on my sweatpants because I'm feeling so swollen and bloated. So knowing that setup of like hypertension plus MI, left-sided heart failure is likely, but looking at the full picture, like I'm not hearing crackles or anything in the lungs, but I am seeing someone with ascites, peripheral edema, like they can't put their jeans on, their socks don't fit. Further assessment, JVD for sure. We leaned him back at that 45 degrees and could definitely see that those jugular veins were noticeably distended. When I palpated his abdomen, he was like, oh, that hurts pressed on that liver and definitely could feel that. So we knew that there was systemic congestion of fluid. All right. What labs are we going to get to evaluate this heart failure? The biggest one I want you guys thinking about is something called a BNP, a B-type natriuretic peptide. This is a peptide that the right atrium of the heart makes when it stretches. So when we get preload going back to the heart, it stretches and the heart is like, oh, I need to contract to push this blood forward and get this fluid moving out to the lungs for the right side and out to the body for the left side. So the more the heart stretches, the more B-type notriuretic peptide that the body produces. It's like supply and demand, right? We stretch a lot. We need to contract harder. So we make more of that BNP. So we draw those BNP levels to evaluate for fluid overload. If we have really high BNP, we know there is tons of preload, tons of fluid stretching that right atrium and telling the heart, hey, you need to contract really hard because we got a lot of fluid here. In this client, obviously, the ventricles can't contract really hard. One, he's already had an MI, so contractility is reduced. Two, he's got really high afterload with that hypertension, so it's even more pressure to push against. So in this case, BNP was super high. It came back over 100,000, if I'm remembering correctly. You don't need to go memorize the normal values for BNP. You just need to know, hey, they're really low. We don't really want a lot of BNP. The higher it is, the more fluid overloaded I'm going to be. And BNP is really the lab we think of when we think of heart failure. So what happened in this guy was 
boom, high afterload, poor contractility, postmyocardial infarction, the left ventricle got worn out and could not pump blood forward to the lungs. That fluid backed up in the lungs, got really high pressure, and the right ventricle had to work harder and harder to push the blood through the pulmonary circuit. Eventually, it couldn't keep up, so that blood filled up back behind the right ventricle in the body. So that liver was full. That's why we had that hepatomegaly. We pressed on his liver. That hurt. That belly was full of fluid. That ascites. Those jugular veins were full. That JVD. He had that edema, that peripheral edema. Okay? So what are we going to do about it? Well, name of the game is we've got to get fluid off. We started IV diuretics. This was furosemide in this case, and that helped pull off some of the fluid. We obviously also had to restrict fluids, and with that, restrict sodium. Remember, water follows salt, so more sodium, more fluid retention. And with that, another way to help get that fluid off, make sure he is ambulating. Even if we're just getting up to the chair, elevating legs, that's going to help with a little bit of that venous return. Now, discharge teaching. Once we're pulling off that fluid, supporting that heart, what are the big things we're teaching going home with heart failure? Weigh yourself daily and call if you gain more than three to five pounds in a week. Remember, if you retain that fluid really fast, your weight goes up and that tells us my heart isn't moving fluid forward, okay? We talked about this in the last episode with the left-sided heart failure, same situation. Again, similarities with low-sodium diet, that deli meat, canned soup, not going to do it. We're going to avoid NSAIDs like ibuprofen since they can cause some sodium retention. Acetaminophen is recommended instead. Again, with the diuretics, furosemide. This client did definitely go home on furosemide with all of that fluid retention. So we want to teach to take that in the morning. Don't be taking it at night or you're going to be having to get up to go to the bathroom and then that's a fall risk. So yeah, lots of similarities with what we talked about in the last episode on that left-sided heart failure. What are some things that are a little bit different in that right-sided heart failure with that client that really has that systemic congestion? You need to focus on peripheral perfusion, abdominal symptoms like the nausea or bloating, and make sure the client is elevating their legs and ambulating. That's going to help with that venous return and diuresing. Same thing with the NSAIDs. Really, the key takeaway is which symptoms tell us that that right side of the heart is failing. Right-sided, we are backing up into the body. Like we learned last time, in the left side, L for left, L for lungs, we have fluid backing up in the lungs. And what's the most common cause of that right-sided heart failure? The left side. They often come together where that left-sided heart failure causes the right. So now let's circle back around to our practice question and see if you can get to that correct answer and know why. You, the nurse, are assessing a client recently admitted with a diagnosis of heart failure. The client reports decreased appetite, they feel bloated, they have pitting edema, JVD, lungs are clear bilaterally, and they're not short of breath. Which of the following supports the diagnosis of right-sided heart failure? Would it be A, bilateral crackles and orthopnea, B, frothy sputum and O2 of 89%, C, JVD with peripheral edema, or D, S3 heart sounds and exertional dyspnea? Now, before we get into the right answer, I do want to give you a test-taking tip here. When you have a set of symptoms, you've got four different answer choices with all symptoms here. I really want you to look and see if there are similarities. We're looking for a diagnosis or a symptom, I should say, that supports that diagnosis of right-sided heart failure. Now, in our answer choices, A, B, and D, all three of those, those were respiratory signs, crackles, orthopnea, frothy sputum decreased O2, exertional dyspnea. These are all things that have to do with the lungs. So even if I can't remember L for left, L for lungs, right-sided body, even if, if my brain is not putting the pieces together there, 
I see that three of my four choices all kind of lump together and point towards the respiratory system. I only have one answer choice that is focused on systemic. So that jumps out at me as being the correct answer. C, jugular venous distension, peripheral edema, that is the only symptom there pointing towards systemic fluid overload. And that's what happens in our right-sided heart failure. All right, the other things, they are more indicative of respiratory signs that happen with left-sided heart failure. Remember, key takeaway, L for left, L for lungs. Right-sided, we have those systemic symptoms. All right, future nurses, that is a wrap. If you found this pod helpful, I'd love to continue supporting your nursing journey through nursing school, the NCLEX, continuing ed, and beyond. Archer Nursing has you covered with on-demand video lectures, high-yield question banks, live case study reviews, and so, so much more. We want to help you master tough concepts and make it fun. So join us over at archerreview.com. Follow us on socials at Archer Nursing for more free nursing tips and study resources. Thanks for tuning in to Pulse Check with Archer Nursing. I'm Dr. Morgan Taylor, and I'll see you back next time.